All right, let's have a conversation about radiators. Now, the radiator that came with the bike, whether it be an ATV or a motorcycle, you want to mount it in the coolest place possible for this. And I don't mean cool by temperature, I mean cool by cool looking. You can put it behind the seat, but there's cooler places to put it. Um, this is going to get you plenty of airflow, and it's probably the easiest to mount, and your hoses will line up better with your water pump on your engine. But we all know it looks cool. It looks cool to have your radiator sitting on the back behind your roll bar. Now, if you roll over, you're probably going to damage your radiator, but radiators are super inexpensive. So it's a small price to pay for coolness. So that's where we're going to mount it. So on the bike, you have the fan on the back side because this sits in front of the engine, but your tube inlet and outlet are on the back side. So you'd either have a Mad Max crazy thing going on with your hoses. What I do is I flip it. Now flipping it makes you have to cross your inlet and outlet, but that's something that's behind the seat. So you're not really going to see it, but we have the fan to deal with and still gets plenty of airflow over these vents. So let's, let's do that. All right, flipping the fan on the Polaris radiators is pretty easy. All I did was buy extended bolts, since the tabs are on the top and the bottom, ran the fan on the back side and extended the bolts down to where they hold in. This is actually backwards. So the hoses go down, but they cross. This one goes to the left side, the other one's coming out to the right. But like I said, you don't see it. You just see a hose coming down. Now on my YZF 600, these are riveted in on here and they're brackets that come down in front of the radiator core. So to do this, we're gonna have to cut these rivets out, flip these brackets to the other side, do a little trimming and rivet them back in. Now I didn't buy the whole bike. I got this sucker off of eBay and it came with one of the mounts broken. So I had to bend a piece of aluminum and braze it on there. All right, now it looks like these tabs were held in place by some kind of uh, aluminum bonding, chemical bonding agent. So they were sitting on this side and we're just gonna flip them to this side and rivet them in. Now, a radiator, in case you don't know how they work, there's a flat piece of tube that runs between all of these fins. These fins soak up all the heat of the fluid running through them. So when you drill through here to get your rivet in, don't puncture this top tube. There's not one running just under here. This is your first one. So as long as you can drill into here without damaging that, you can put a rivet in, no problem. All right, so one fin reversed, that puts our outlets going down instead of up. So now we gotta figure out how we want to mount this thing. Now, for considerations, obviously to get the most airflow, you want to get this at the steepest angle possible without making it look weird. You still want it pretty flat against the back. And the ones I've had lay pretty flat and still the temperature does not get above 210, 220. As soon as the fan kicks on, drops it right back down to 180. So I, I don't think laying it down has that much effect. Uh, from what I read, because I researched everything, from what I read, the angle does change it and you need to have more surface area. So for example, if this stood straight up and this is a 12 inch radiator, laying it down at a 30 degree angle could mean that you need a 30% increase or a 16 inch radiator. But I will cross that when I get there and just use this and if anything, make some cool ducting 
to redirect air through the radiator. That's a better troubleshooting thing for me personally. So considerations, how you're gonna mount it, uh, proper airflow, putting this crossbar here for the AD004 race compliance actually gives us a great way to mount this lower tab. Now, obviously you wanna be able to get to your gas tank. If you roll it, you wanna be able to get it home. So it's not just damage repair. If you dump all your radiator fluid out on the trail, you're not getting home. You are stuck there until somebody tows you out or you can run it till it gets hot, shut it down, let it cool. I'm gonna continue just fitting this up, see where it goes, and then I'll uh, get it mounted in there. Uh, vibration, you don't want metal on metal. So you want enough clearance to let these grommets work and absorb some of the vibration from the engine. Oh yeah. Oh, and your cap. You don't want to pin your cap against your roll bar to where you can't get it off. That easy. I think that's going to be a winner right there. All right, two out of three were easy. Um, that's why I just went ahead and welded them up. Now, a couple things we can do. We could run another cross member and have this be stronger. It would add more weight and it would actually, I don't know, it would make sense. It wouldn't be in the way of anything else. We could run an L bracket off of here. I am just going to make an L bracket and then I'll weight test it. If that doesn't work, we're out of five inch tab and we make the cross member and mount it symmetrically like the other one. Now that is one sturdy mount radiator. Check it out. Now, something I do, and it's hard to see unless you're looking really closely, is it is a half a degree tilted this way and a half a degree higher or I don't know 16th of an inch higher on this side that's because when you fill it you need the air bubble to run up to this corner um, if you have it tilted the other way or even flat you're going to get a bunch of air in your radiator so neat trick which now that I pointed out it's super obvious <laughs> if you see this thing ripping around you're not going to know any difference but your cooling system's gonna run a lot better. And that's the look we're going for right there. A nice tucked radiator. Um, I'm actually really excited about how this came out because um, adding that cross member to make it an AD004 for the rules, I didn't think the radiator was gonna fit as nicely. But that fits really well. Now, on this VF1, the radiator is in a different place and there's a, a reason for that. The gas tank is from the ATV. The fill cap is way back. So when you try to put it on the roof, you can't get to your gas tank. So that's the reason I put that behind the seat. Just trying it out, see how it works. Um, obviously all this stuff can be changed. This is your project. And this one's been rolled a couple times. Uh, the first time it messed up the radiator, I had to replace it. Uh, the second time, it didn't, but you can see the roof line and how it sticks up. Now, it gets plenty of airflow, especially laminar airflow coming off the roof, but this one I'm really happy because check it out. Now, this one shouldn't roll because it's so low, but if it does, the radiator may not suffer at all. That roof line, and get the right angle so you can see this, that roof line runs right at that fan. So it would have to be a very specific roll. That same roll that busted the other one would not have messed this one up. Uh, this made me realize I don't have an overflow tank for this because I didn't buy the whole bike. So I'm gonna source an overflow tank and get that set up. Uh, there's plenty of neat places to mount it in here where it can be tucked away. All right, so next we're gonna talk about something near and dear to my heart. And that is hydraulic clutch conversion. Now, uh, most bikes come with a cable clutch 
And there's a reason that they can get away with that. It's because they use a cam, which takes all the torque from having a clutch on your bike and moves it to this right here. This is your cam. As you pull on this, this cam extends, pushes this rod, which releases your clutch. So having a cable clutch not only is hard to calibrate your end links, because if this doesn't go full forward, then your clutch will not fully engage and you're gonna burn up your clutch. Now on a hydraulic system with a master cylinder, if the pedal's all the way out, this is all the way in. You don't have to fuss with it. The only thing you do have to mess with is how much your clutch releases. But as you can see, there's a lot of travel here. So you can overstroke your clutch, which is why I buy the Tilton pedals that has a stopper on it. So we know exactly how much play we're getting and we can push that clutch, check our throw and set it exactly where we want it. So we have fully engaged with no pressure on the system all the way up to however much, uh, however you want your pedal to feel. If you release your pedal and want that instant uh, grip with your clutch, you can set that. If you want, you know, a little bit like a midpoint, you can set that. Just be careful not to overstroke your clutch. All right, now I'm gonna give you the secret. I've given away a lot of my secrets, but I don't care because I want builders to be able to build this and enjoy it. This is what it is. This is a Harris Amazon special um, hydraulic clutch conversion. Now, what makes this different than most things is that when you apply hydraulic pressure to this, it doesn't push it pulls. So you have this much play to work with. And as you can see by this threaded rod, it's fully adjustable. This rod is the same diameter as the clutch cable used. So this is gonna be plenty strong enough. This has a friction adjustment right here, which I thought was a throw adjustment. <laughs> but if you move it, it makes this harder to pull. So you can adjust through this um, how hard it is to move your clutch which is pretty slick in this small package and these are super dirt cheap um, you may need to replace this it may get leaky i'm sure these seals wear out because this is not like a name brand kind of thing uh, i think magura or magura however you pronounce it makes something similar but it is at least four times the cost so, this is where your cable clutch goes in. The only thing we need to do is figure out how to get this in there. That should be pretty easy. So we'll start by disassembling it. Keep your parts organized. I know my workbench is a mess, but this is all the same day. I'm just hammering out all the little stuff I got going on, all the little finishing things the boot off and you can see here's the action right here so there's two nuts on here don't let this fall out there's two nuts on here just pull those off leave one intact or one on there now that's not gonna slide through oh my gosh oh my gosh it's the same thread all right, so to show you how short the throw is on this, this lines up with your clutch and there's a little ball in there just like a brake or anything else. So we're just gonna set that ball into this joint. With that in the correct position, you can see there is not much throw there. And there we go, one hydraulic clutch all hooked up. You push the pedal, Fills this with hydraulic fluid and pulls that out. Too easy. Now we'll do final adjustment on this in final assembly, but just getting it on the chain cover and ready for use is what we're doing here. There it is. Shift linkage back on. This now has a hydraulic clutch.
Well, that's it for today, CrossCart fans. Uh, we got our race legal cross member in to make an AD004 uh, roll cage setup. We got our radiator mounted. We got our shift linkage in, and we put a hydraulic clutch on. Now, all of this stuff is just a day of work. So this is what, build video 15, 16? That means I've spent 16 days working on this, and that's with stopping to set the camera up, film it, make sure it's good, and edit the video. So this is really only, I don't know, I'd say 10 days of work in. Um, I really hope this helps everybody out there. We're getting really close to uh, finishing this up and having some test drives in it. Uh, snow's starting to melt. My plan is, you know, the first good day of spring when the weather breaks is have three buggies to go rip around and start testing and evaluating. Um, all the gearing I did for this one is on paper. And as you know, things on paper can differ from how something feels. So if the top speed of this is 150, but I like how it feels in the lower gears, or the top speed turns out to be only 90, but I like rowing it, that's how I'm gonna set it up. So I decided to do an airbox delete. Um, it was getting a little tight in here. Uh, four K&Ns with some pre-filters over it, I think it's gonna look really cool. And I love the sound of engine intakes. Whenever you put a cold air intake or an aftermarket intake and delete that air box, just that low end grunt sound coming from the intake, I, I like it. Now I've read that deleting the ram air and rejetting the carbs, you lose four horsepower. Even at 90 horsepower, you're gonna have trouble getting these tires to hook up. Um, we're not running drag slicks, we're not on pavement, we're on dirt. So, in my humble opinion, having way too much horsepower doesn't do any, you any good unless you can put that power to the ground. Um, if we were running super aggressive tires or drag racing this or running it on asphalt, oh yeah, I would have a million horsepower. But uh, it has to be, there has to be a balance there. Um, that's why I like the ATV motors so much. When you trail ride, I mean, how many people trail ride a four cylinder 600 cc engine? Not very many, because it doesn't make any sense. Um, if I was out running the dunes, oh yeah. But I just don't have those kind of areas near me. Um, hopefully, a cross cart picks up in the US and somebody opens a track near me and I can just take this for a rip on an actual track where 100 horsepower would make sense. So as far as the airbox delete, Losing four horsepower isn't a big deal to me. Um, I can just gear it for the acceleration I want for the area I'm riding. All right, I'll see you guys next time. Thanks for watching.